Bien, il y a une chose. Brava, brava. Nice. Before we start, just the um, additional details on the afternoon of uh, Thursday. So we'll have uh, two talks now, there are two other things. Uh, then there will be the talk on, on mathematics and, and, and vector structure. Okay. And then at 5.30, we'll meet down there at the bus stop for our, for our hike. And I should say, really, that even though we don't hike in the, in the program, it's, it's a must that we have to hike. Okay. <laughs> 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 at the dentist's store, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll go up here, we'll see the gardens of uh, Miramar, and then we'll walk along the seaside uh, to the Barnacles of Lana. Okay, so no reason for this uh, set out at all the next 40 meters as you go, I'm sorry, <laughs> but also no need to worry. And then we should get there at about, I don't know, 7, 7, 16, something like that. So then we have a nice view of the Barnacles of Lana. Okay? So, so as I said, now I'll give uh, over to Marco. Yeah. Okay, we'll Thank you for the introduction. Um, hi, everybody. This is the session after lunch, so I'll try to keep it as light as possible. And um, yeah, as Marco said, um, I want to explain the title a little bit first. So I, I will talk about matrix factorization, but um, we will introduce a method to analyze, let's say, um, algorithms, provided that there are some, uh, that are supposed to, to work in a, in a certain scheme, in a certain framework that we call decimation, with some techniques that come from, uh, from, from the analysis of neural networks of uh, associative memory, whose uh, maybe most celebrated example is the Hopefield network. So, I just have a couple of introductory slides about it. Um, the Hopefield network is a recurrent neural network that is tasked with the memorization of uh, p patterns that are n-dimensional uh, vectors, this bold xi mu here. And uh, um, we say that the network works if, um, I mean, provided we give it a suffi a sufficiently close, well, an input that is sufficiently close to one of the patterns, it is able to recall it in some sense that we will see in the next slide. 
So this memory effect is in particular, uh, can be given through this Hebbian matrix here, this JIJ, that you can think of uh, as the, the weights of this connection in this complete graph on the, on the left, okay, between the neurons. And uh, this matrix is such that if you are lucky enough, which means uh, if there is not too much noise in the problem, then the patterns that you want to recall, if they are more or less orthogonal between them, and also here there will be a thing that we discussed yesterday with Spencer, this almost orthogonality here will play a central role. So if they are almost orthogonal and, they are not, and there are not too many, the, the patterns will be the ground states of, the, of this energy. Okay, so this is the way you are, I mean, you, you must use this fact to recall them, okay? So how do we do it in, in practice when it is possible? Well, one can run the so-called neural dynamics. So you, you, up, you take, you generate speed configuration starting from a, a certain initialization that has to be good enough. And in the end, hopefully you will converge somewhere that will look like a pattern, more or less. Or you can run simulated annealing, that is another routine uh, that aims for the ground states of a, of a given energy. So if the ground states correspond to the patterns, you have found one, provided you start uh, from a good point. Or again, you can run message passing algorithms like approximate message passing, and there are some experts in this room. Uh, so you should, I should be careful. <laughs> um, okay, and, and you run this AMP's algorithm. This is in practice what I did to test my, my computations on this uh, Boltzmann-Gibbs measure, uh, which is proportional to this Boltzmann factor, e to the minus beta energy. And when beta is very large, this low, uh, sorry, inverse absolute temperature, then the idea is that uh, you will give uh, a probability weight much higher to the ground states and, and exponentially smaller to the, to the higher energy states, okay? So all these three methods share a common ground. They're, I mean, uh, same phase of, of the same problem, more or less are different phases of the same problem. So they all aim at sampling the Boltzmann-Gibbs measure at very low temperature, more or less. And secondly, as we required, they all work provided that we, pro we, we give the network a good initialization, which is sufficiently close to a pattern, otherwise they don't work. <clears throat> okay, so there is a, a phenomenon that occurs here that is due to this near orthogonality, which is not exact orthogonality. So when we are in very high dimension, when these patterns are n-dimensional vectors with n going to infinity, uh, by the law of large numbers, you can indeed expect that if this, the, the components of this pattern are IID drawn from a center, certain distribution, then they are almost orthogonal. Typically, this scalar product is a delta, so it is a diagonal, but it, it can have uh, some off-diagonal terms of order of subleading order, of order 1 over square root n. And uh, this is what pattern interference is, basically, because uh, it is true that these contributions, off the diagonal contribution are small, but there's many of them. So when you sum them up together, you obtain something finite that you cannot neglect in this uh, precise scaling. And uh, this poses a, an intrinsic limitation to the number of patterns that you can store in the network, because it has not infinite memory. It can store, uh, well, the, the, let's say the, the parameter that controls how many patterns you can store is this alpha. P over n, and the interesting regime is, of course, when, uh, when P and n scale together to infinity, which means that P over n is a finite number, okay? So th this has also a nice geometrical interpretation, if you want. Well, any sample from this Boltzmann-Gibbs measure that, that you have, but in general, any, any vector in Rn, can have an extensive order n projection only onto a finite number of patterns, because its norm has to be controlled with, a, with n, more or less. And the other projections must be uh, necessarily of subleading order. But again, there's many of them, so when we sum up them together, we obtain a, a source of noise in the end, okay? This will be explained a little better later. So now we finally turn to the problem I'm, uh, we are interested in, we were interested in, I'm still interested in, um, <laughs> which is high rank matrix factorization. Um, that I formulate here as an inference problem, and uh, let me just say, let me mention that um, it, this is in a very stylized version, okay? The more general version would be asymmetric. Uh, <coughs> so this psi matrix would be different from the, from the other factor, but here we consider the symmetric case uh, for the sake of simplicity for now, because this is what we can treat. So the problem is, is the following. You generate this uh, matrix that I call psi, and it is not casual. It has p columns and um, of n-dimensional vectors, so it is an n by p matrix. Okay, 
And uh, its elements are IID drawn from a, cert uh, from a certain centered distribution with uh, some finite fourth or sixth model, okay? Regular enough, let's say. And, uh, um, all right, and this ratio P over N will play, will play a crucial role also, also later. Then you take the, the product psi psi transpose, which is at most, let's say, roughly a rank P matrix in theory, and you add some Gaussian noise. This will yield these observations Y, and the, the, the task in this inference problem is to recover uh, not only the matrix psi psi transpose, but psi, but psi, so one of the two factors, in this case they are equal, but one of the two factors, given just the observations Y. So uh, one of the most common approaches to this is the so-called base optimal approach. So you, you put yourself in the base optimal setting in which the statistician that is tasked with this reconstruction knows everything about the generating uh, character features of, of this model, okay? So he knows exactly how the Ys have been generated. He has the exact model through the Ys, uh, through which the Ys are generated, okay? Um, so this yields, um, I'm, I'm really running quickly on this because uh, <laughs> of time constraints, but this yields usually what are called the fundamental limits, okay? So in the best possible scenario, which is when the statistician knows everything he, he has to know except for the ground truth psi itself, otherwise the task is meaningless. So in this case, uh, it is, as it is reasonable, the statistician makes the, the, the minimum mean square error uh, possible in, in the reconstruction of psi, okay? And, um, okay, the problem is that in order to access this quantity, this minimum mean square error that, that uh, uh, constitutes a fundamental limit, you need to compute this object, this three entropy phi, that is a very complicated uh, matrix model with quenched disorder that, uh, to my best knowledge, nobody knows how to compute yet, at least if the x's are not, uh, um, well, if the prior here, if, if the peak size here are not Ga IID Gaussians, then there is no solution to, to, the, to the limit of this, of this quantity when n and p scale together to infinity and NMP goes to, uh, go together to infinity with a finite ratio alpha. All right, so why is it interesting? Well, I'm, I'm okay. I will fly quickly again on this because I'm, I'm, I'm no expert of this, but it just helps uh, me giving a bit of, um, of motivation. So in its asymmetric version, which, we, which will be the official one, let's say, matrix factorization is employed in image and video restoration, for instance. And, and in painting, so it is usually used to, to, to fill in uh, matrices where, where you miss elements ex or to reconstruct them. And uh, in, in this setting, you, uh, one usually imposes that B is, is sparse, so it is a very sparse matrix in such a way that it creates very, uh, let's say, uh, combinations of few elements uh, in A. And, and the elements of A have to form an overcomplete basis in order to, you know, um, in order to conserve the complexity that is stored in Y, in some sense. So we also, okay, it is also used in the recommendation systems, again, uh, in order to find missing elements, I mean, the, the most uh, likely missing elements in the matrix. But uh, you can also see it as a high-rank uh, version of spiked models, so I, I thank the, this morning's speaker for, for the assist. Um, so when P is finite, actually, this quantity here is computable, it is well studied, it can be computed by rigorous and non-rigorous means, as you like. And the fundamental limits of this problem are well known. Here I started just a reference, but there, there, there's people in this room that have uh, contributed significantly to this, so I apologize if I not uh, cited everyone. Um, okay, but now what happens when P and N scale together? This question stands. And um, I want to quickly mention also this related problem, which is denoising, it's not exactly matrix factorization because denoising the the requires the statistician to do slightly less in the sense that you need to find just the, mat the matrix psi psi transpose and not the, the factor per se, okay? So there is a way to do it uh, even when the, when the rank of the hidden matrix is full, uh, that is this rotational invariant estimator for instance. And it is not optimal in the sense of uh, information theoretical sense, of course, it is not always optimal, I should say. And uh, so the rotational invariant estimator works as follows. You assume that the, the, the best estimator you can produce diagonalizes on the same eigenbasis of the data, of Y, okay? So once you have taken care of, of these uh, orthogonal matrices, the, of the eigenbasis, you just need a, a cleaning procedure for the spectrum. 
that was studied by uh, Boone, Le Bouchot, and Potters, okay? And, and it is this one here. I, won't ent I will not enter into the details, of course. But uh, I wanted to mention because later we will test the performance of our procedure in metrics denoising. Because if you do metrics fractalization, you have also an estimator for the, for the excite site transpose, okay? For the entire matrix. We will test it against the, the rotational invariant estimator, okay? With this uh, matrix mean square error, which is simply a Frobenius norm of the difference. Okay, so now um, we have seen that uh, the base optimal limits, the fundamental limits in the, for this inference problem are still not accessible, are out of reach nowadays. So we introduced, together with my supervisor, a, um, a feasible, a suboptimal but feasible approach uh, that we call decimation uh, for reasons uh, that shall be clear in a while. Um, so th this, this approach has the, uh, though being suboptimal, it has the advantage of being completely analyzable from a theoretical point of view. So it works as follows. Uh, instead of um, having a matrix model that would you know, uh, force you to look for the entire matrix psi, it's an n by p matrix, we look for one of its columns at a time. Okay? So we split the problem in p separated problems. Okay? So, uh, and it works as follows. As assume that at the first step, Okay, you have this um, data matrix Y. You need to produce an estimate of, uh, of Xi P, the last pattern. It is without loss of generality, we can think of it as the last, uh, the last Xi, Xi P. <clears throat> and we denote this estimate by eta P, and we will see that we obtain this, uh, this estimate by sampling from a certain suitable measure. So once you, uh, provided we are able to do that, it is also not clear. Um, so provided we are able to, pro uh, to produce this eta P, what we do next is we build a rank one contribution, this eta eta p transpose. This is a rank one matrix. And we modify the observations by subtracting this rank one contribution, uh, contribution in this case. So then what we do is that we sample, again, from the, from the same measure, where the data that, of course, um, that of course uh, affect the measure itself, okay, uh, from which we are sampling, where the data are replaced with y1 this time. Okay, and then from this new measure we sample again, and again, and again, and again. Okay, till uh, allegedly, I mean, we hope that we are able to do it p times, so that in the end we will have p estimates of each of these columns of the matrix psi. So we stack them together, and we have an estimate in the end. Okay, so to be more precise, how does the rth decimation step look? So. Um, let R be the number of estimated patterns already. It can be also zero, which means you are at the first step, you know nothing yet, okay? So the modified matrix of, of observations will look like this. So you have subtracted R rank one contributions, and you sample the R plus one estimate from this Boltzmann-Gibbs measure, so E to the minus beta, a certain energy, and this energy is this little monster here. And this is the ugliest slide I have, I think, so <laughs> later it will be easier, hopefully. Um, okay, it, it is important to display it for, for different reasons. Well, the first one is, it is that it, it's rather easy. Uh, it, it's a trace of YR against this, uh, this XX transpose, this <clears throat> basically. And these are um, n-dimensional vectors, this uh, XX transpose, okay? And there are many contributions, but the most interesting ones are the, the blue and the red. So the blue one is uh, the Hamiltonian, or the energy, as you like, minus the energy of the Hopefield model. So here uh, we have the connection with, uh, with the first part of the talk, okay? And this term is responsible for, for an effect that is desirable, uh, also for one that is not desirable. Um, this term favors improbability, because th this guy here goes at the exponent. This favors improbability, those x configurations that are well aligned to patterns, because it has a plus and it is a sum of, of squares. Okay. On the contrary, we have a third red term uh, that comes from the decimation uh, itself. Okay. And this term repels, okay, it, uh, it penalizes in probability those X configurations that are too similar to what you have already estimated. And this makes sense because at each step, you don't want to fall again in the same energy valley. Okay. You want to sample something different and get an estimate of all the measures. Yes. No, 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 this is just, it's a theoretical object. Thank you for the question. 
Later, there will be uh, an algorithm that does not exploit the, um, well, let's say that uh, all the information you need to compute your theoretical analysis is that, uh, is the likelihood of the model. So you, you, you need to know that Y is psi, psi transpose plus noise. And this the statistician knows, okay? So for the theoretical purposes, this is allowed. It is not allowed for an algorithm. <laughs> Good point, uh, okay. So the effect uh, for which we can, uh, I mean, we can blame this hopeful Hamiltonian is pattern interference, unlikely, uh, unluckily, that is inherited by this model and there's nothing to do about that, unfortunately. And this is the greatest limitation of, of this approach. Okay, so you can, you can see, uh, you can think of the, uh, of the decimation uh, procedure also as uh, an action over the energy landscape. So what you're doing is that you're trying to look for the ground states of this uh, energy, okay, of this cost function, call it uh, whatever you like. And uh, hopefully, again, if the patterns are not too many and the noise levels are you know, uh, kept under control, uh, the ground states, uh, this eta mu here, look like uh, a pattern, hopefully. So what happens when you decimate is that you lift in energy the, um, the eta mu, the state, uh, the configuration that you have just found, so that in the future you will not fall uh, fall there again, with the ground state with ground state search algorithms, or also with our algorithm, actually. Okay, so it is clear at this point that in this problem there are three noise sources. The first two uh, are kind of uh, already discussed. Uh, we have the initial Gaussian noise, and this by this is by definition. Then we have pattern interference because of this uh, uh, Hope field light Hamiltonian. And thirdly, uh, and maybe this is the, the least obvious one, it's decimation itself. The procedure introduces artificially some noise in the problem because the, this rank one contribution that we are subtracting step by step are not exactly the patterns. They are blurred version of the patterns. And you can quickly convince yourself that uh, if this eta has nothing to do with the, with the hidden matrix, with one of the columns of the hidden matrix, you, and you subtract this contribution, you're actually increasing the rank of the hidden matrix. And this is not good. You don't want this, okay? In fact, the ultimate goal of decimation uh, is to hope uh, that the estimate you sample is similar enough to one of the patterns so that when you subtract the corresponding rank one contribution, you are decreasing the, the rank of the hidden matrix so that you are bringing the problem towards, uh, let's say, the, the feasible, easier, uh, and already studied um, version. So it is not clear if whether the simulation uh, corrupts itself or, or, or not, at this point, at least. It will be clear in the end. Okay, so we have seen that uh, at each decimation step, uh, we have um, a different energy, okay? Because it depends on this uh, modified observations. So every time you, you have subtracted an additional rank one contribution and the energy and the model itself changes. So you will have a sequence of P models uh, in total, provided you can, you can get to the end. And um, on, of course, uh, the, the, the accuracy with which you can hope to retrieve uh, the, the future pattern, the R plus one pattern, okay, depends on, for sh in, in a way that, uh, that has to be clarified, um, depends on the previous steps, on the previous retrieval accuracy on what you knew, or what you know already on the previous patterns, okay? On how good your reconstruction has been so far. <clears throat> so how can we access this, uh, um, this retrieval accuracy step by step? Well, the, the, the trick is the replica method. So you need, we need to compute this free entropies here, the sequence of free entropies, this phi r plus one, okay? And, uh, and we do it with a, with a replica method and we use a replica symmetric hazards to compute it. And uh, the reason why we do it is that this retrieval accuracies that in our jargon is simply the, the, the overlap, the expected overlap between the pattern that you want to estimate and the typical sample from the ground truth, which is a, a measure of the quality of reconstruction. Uh, sorry, not sample from the ground truth. Uh, sample from uh, the, the, the Boltzmann Gibbs measure, uh, errata. And, um, all right, so this, this overlap turns out to be an order parameter for this model. So if you manage to, to write the th this three entropy through a saddle point, like, 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 you, like we did with the replica method, then you can obtain this retrieval accuracy with the self-consistency equations. 
So the stationary parameter M here that achieves the, uh, at which the, 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 the maximum of this free entropy is attained has to be considered as the uh, R plus one for retrieval accuracy. And the other thing that we can notice is that this free entropy depends as it should on the collection of the previous retrieval, on, on the whole history of the process, okay? So there is no hysteresis in some sense. Okay, um, there is also another interesting thing, and it is this second, uh, well, this term on the second line here. It looks like the free entropy of, uh, of a Gaussian channel, more or less, for those of you that uh, are familiar with it. And um, the interesting thing is that, or also, if you want the free entropy of a gas model with a random magnetic field, where everything is decoupled, and, um, well, where the variance of this random magnetic field is tuned by this parameter R, and if our computations make sense, this parameter R must comprise all the three noise contributions we have discussed so far. And it is indeed the case, okay? So this R is the sum of three contribution. The first one, Ra, this of course you obtain uh, when you extremize the, 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 the variational potential with respect to this parameter. The first contribution, uh, Ra, is the uh, noise, I mean the variance of the noise that is due to the initial Gaussian noise. RB is the pattern interference contribution. This is very similar to, to uh, what presented for, for the Opfer model. And RC is the novel contribution here because this is the decimation noise. And in fact, as you can see, it involves an integral over the history from zero to T, where T is the fraction of uh, already retrieved patterns, is R over P, uh, of this um, ugly function. Uh, so this takes into account that. Okay, so these two uh, main questions still stand, in particular the first one. So does the summation corrupt itself too much? Now we have the tools to say yes or no because we have the theoretical analysis, okay? And uh, provided it starts with the low enough noise levels, is it able to retrieve all the patterns or it stops at a certain point? And yeah, the second question that we will see later is, uh, is there an efficient way to implement it? Because this is a theoretical analysis, as Marilou was pointing out, it is not an algorithm, okay? So, the first, um, to the first question, uh, the answer is yes, fortunately. So, it turns out that the summation does not corrupt itself. And, in fact, provided that we can start uh, at low enough noise levels, so with alpha, small, and, and delta, the initial Gaussian noise, low enough, then the summation is it not only able to retrieve all the patterns, but uh, the retrieval accuracy increases along the procedure. So you see here in this plot, we have the red curve, that is the, the curve predicted by the theory of the retrieval accuracies. You have the, uh, the first retrieval accuracy here is this blue dot, and it is obtained with uh, an approximate message passing algorithm initialized uh, with an informative initialization with a warm star, as we said this morning. And uh, <clears throat> you see that the, the next magnetizations uh, are higher and higher, okay? So the retrieval on the next patterns will be better and better, which means that the summation, uh, which means that the benefit that you gain by subtracting this rank one contribution um, is more than what you lose by introducing artificially this noise during the procedure. So the procedure can get through. At least for all the tests we have run, uh, that are with uh, easing prior, this, this plot is with easing prior, plus minus one, Rademacher if you want, uh, with Rademacher sparse, sparse prior, so introducing a little, well, also an aggressive sparsity as we shall see later, and uniform, this behavior, uh, also with, with continuous variables like uniform, this behavior is confirmed, okay? So, question number two, is there any algorithm able to do it, to actually make it? Uh, the question is, yes to this specific, uh, sorry, the answer is yes to this specific question. Um, we have formulated this ground state oracle that is made up of uh, three ingredients. So the first one is, the, uh, is a simulated annealing routine to look for the ground states of this energy that can be very rugged in principle, okay? The second one is of course uh, decimation. So once you, you have converged somewhere that you accept as a pattern or as a, as a column, you subtract it and then you run the simulated annealing routine again. And the third one is a restarting criterion because as I said, since this uh, uh, energy landscape can be very rugged and very difficult to explore for the algorithm, 
uh, it is often the case that it gets stuck in metastable states, which is not what you want. You want the ground state, okay? Uh, so you need a criterion to discern whether the, the, the object you have converted, the configuration you have converged to is really a ground state or not. So what, you, what we do is that we compute the, the related energy and we test it against the energy of the ground states that is predicted by theory. When this, uh, when this energy is higher, we discard what we have found and we start all over, <clears throat> all over again, okay? All right, so how does this uh, ground state oracle, we called it oracle, works? Well, it works pretty fine. Um, it is uh, in not in uh, a striking agreement with the theory as the, as the previous AMP was, but it needs no informative initialization. So um, this is again for Rademacher prior. So this, this ground state oracle, at <coughs> least the simulated annealing routine is particularly simple with the with uh, um, Rademacher prior. And uh, uh, okay, and here, so the number of the dimensionality is uh, 1300 and uh, alpha is 0 0.03. So it's not really high rank still, but uh, it is extensive, strictly speaking. And, um, and yeah, so the ground state oracle manages to get through, okay? Especially sometimes it reconstructs exactly the pattern with, with no error <coughs> when the noise levels are low enough. So how does it perform with, uh, in comparison with the rotational invariant estimator? It performs, uh, again, provided that the noise levels are low enough so that it can actually start the first step. It performs better than, re than the rotational invariant estimator. And this we could expect already uh, because the rotational invariant estimator is a purely spectral estimator. It does not take into account at all the uh, prior structure, structural information about the, about the signal, okay? Uh, whereas the summation does. The, the prior is explicitly inserted there. So you see that the red curve of, of the rotational invariant estimator is, is worse here than, than the two other uh, curves obtained uh, through, through the summation, okay? I, I don't wanna stop too much on this. How much time do I have left? Uh, 15 minutes? 15 minutes? Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, maybe I tried it too many times, I don't know. Uh, it went pretty fast. Okay, okay, okay. So the problem is that, and um, the problem is that this algorithm is not efficient, not at all. And yeah, as you can see from this plot, uh, it, has, it requires, uh, you remember there is a restarting criterion, right? So the number of times you converge to, to wrong states grows exponentially with n. Even though the, the exponential increase is, is mild because we managed to run it up to n equal to 2500 already, which is uh, considerable uh, dimensionality already, we cannot go further than that because uh, the exponential um, complexity destroys it, okay? You need to wait like forever to find just the first pattern. Then it becomes better and better, of course, towards the end, but um, the first one is a nightmare. Okay, so this, all of this was for Rademacher prior, so, um, and the theory was for generical priors, so you might wonder what happens with, uh, with the other priors. Well, uh, we're still in the process of uh, testing numerically, I mean, the theory is there, but we're still in the process of testing uh, numerically our, <clears throat> our decimation procedure uh, with other priors, but we have a rather complete picture with, uh, with sparse prior, like, this, like this, this one here, where we introduce this parameter rho that interpolates between the Rademacher prior when rho equals one, and when rho is, is uh, very small instead, uh, it's, it is very sparse. Like if, if rho is 0 0.15 or 0 0.2, like here, let's say 0 0.2, 80% of the components of, of the patterns are zero. So the, the, the matrix xi xi transpose is very sparse, okay? So only a row square of the components are non-zero in the matrix xi xi transpose. Okay, so here you get again, uh, the, uh, here I plotted the MSC and not the retrieval accuracy. This is the mean square error, which is the, the, I mean, the square norm of the difference between the pattern and our estimates eta mu, okay? It is another measure of, of accuracy, which is more, uh, let's say, suitable for this case due to some norm fluctuations uh, in the estimators. Uh, but you can see that this mean square error on, on the retrieval of the patterns decreases. So that this, this behavior is still confirmed. 
and um, in red you have the, the theoretical curve here, and in blue you have some, some points obtained with the AMP, again with the informative initialization that are in, in good agreement with the theory. And yeah, this AMP was run with beta equal to 10, you know, so the theory. <coughs> okay, so uh, why, do, why were we uh, interested in sparsity in the first place? Uh, it is because we expected, and it is actually the case, that sparsity helps the system to become more robust against the, source of noise, the sources of noise that we have in the model. In fact, what you are seeing here is the phase diagram for different, for different values of sparsity of uh, the first decimation step. So when you're trying to find the, the first pattern, in particular, forget about the dashed lines. Sorry about that. Didn't have time to, to raise them. Uh, but for instance, where rho equals one, and you start the decimation procedure below this curve, this red curve, the solid red curve, so with small enough alpha and, and delta, then the simulation is able to, to, to estimate the first pattern, and then it is able to estimate the second, and so on. So it, it gets simply through, okay? Um, but you see that <clears throat> when sparsity is rather aggressive, like 0 0.1, this retrieval region here, uh, it, it increases sensibly, and where, when rho is 0 0.05, it becomes huge, okay? So the, the, you can store a lot of patterns here, okay? So alpha can be 0 0.48, Eight, if I well remember. So you can, uh, you can store, if you have uh, n equal to 2,000, you can store uh, 960 patterns inside here, which is a lot, okay? Uh, it is absolutely not accessible with, uh, with Rademacher plus minus one's patterns, okay? Um, all right. So even if sparsity helps in theory, uh, it creates also a nightmare on the other side because the energy landscape, and this is, uh, I, I obtained this plot just last, last week. So, well, yeah, I should be careful about that. But uh, I have, um, what are you? Yeah, it's a B. Uh, we, um, I think that what happens here is that, unfortunately, sparsity also creates a golf course energy landscape. Uh, which is very bad because it, uh, what is a golf, uh, golf course? It's like it's flat everywhere and this is due to the fact that when you have a sparsity like rho equal to 0 0.15, 85% of the components of, of, of the patterns are zero and in the matrix psych side transpose that is the one responsible for the attraction towards the ground states um, has only rho square non-zero elements that are very few, okay? Very few. So what happens here is that as long as there are many patterns stored in this memory, there are many uh, pits in this golf course, and so you have a high chance in falling in one of them. But as in this case, when alpha be becomes very small, like 0 0.001, so you have in this case in particular only one pattern stored there, you have only one pit in this huge golf course, that is flat almost everywhere. So if you run an energy-based method like, like simulated annealing, that, like the routine we have, it takes a lot to find the last pattern, paradoxically, but it takes very uh, few iterations to find, the, to find the first one. And uh, yeah, I think that with this, I am over. Thank you very much. Yes, sure. <laughs> uh, sure. Here we use the replica symmetric ansatz, but there is this uh, the Almeida Taulis line. We didn't we didn't venture into the replica symmetric computation because uh, it's a, it's a real nightmare. And uh, I mean the the AMP algorithm that, that that we run to test our 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 plot. Uh, let's say it was more likely that it matched the, the replica symmetric prediction instead that. Uh, the replica symmetric breaking one. So we, we settled for that, let's say. Even for the optical model itself, I, I don't know a replica symmetric breaking computation, but maybe there is one. There is one? Okay. <laughs> one RSB scheme? Yeah, it could be, yeah. <laughs> People, <flee. laughs> they leave, okay. 
<laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it could be, yes. Yeah, sure. I, it is, I mean, there are ways to regularize this effect. For instance, I, I've experimented that if I add noise, of course the reconstruction is worse, but this basin of attraction gets wider. So it converges before, uh, sorry, in, in, in fewer iterations, paradoxically. This is what I was telling Federica, yes. <laughs> Yeah, this, uh, I still have to understand this, to be honest. Yeah, yeah 10 components different than zero in a, in a thousand by a thousand matrix is it's not much. Yes. <laughs> Another question, please? <laughs> no. The... <laughs> This, sorry? The ah, this eta. Uh, this eta are obtaining by sampling the, I mean, they are the ground states of this energy here. The, the um, simulated annealing routine is a way to, to, yeah, to sample the ground state of this, of this energy that allegedly uh, <coughs> look like patterns. They, they do, they do, in, in feasible regions of the phase space. This is an excellent question. <laughs> so the first one is a, the first one, uh, okay, this is sufficient. The first one is a simple AMP with, uh, with Y as the data of, um, of the observation matrix, okay? It is a rank one AMP. Uh, I mean, I'm not looking for low rank components, okay? I'm looking for a, for a vector of components. Um, is, that, is that clear? Then once you find a final configuration, you build the rank one, you subtract it from, from the Y and you run A and P with Y1. The noise and function in the case of Eisen spins is hyperbolic tangent. But maybe you can do something more accurate. But it, it matches the, the theory. I don't know. Uh, it's not, uh, this problem, yeah, I mean, uh, strictly speaking, this computation is not in the Bayes optimal set. I mean, the denoiser. Sorry, sorry? It's not very obvious to me how you come up with the different gaps. I know. No, the no, the no. tonnage gap comes from the fact that that's what you use during the computation. Yes, yes. And, and here, maybe I should have said it, the statistician is base optimal, but since he doesn't, since they don't know uh, a base optimal strategy to do the noise or to find psi, they use this suboptimal routine. This one? Yes. Yes. Well, it is that of the optimal one. I mean, it's not. Um, that is this, the the retrieval phase. The the one you're asking for is the is the intersection with oh, this okay. dashed line. Yeah, yeah, but there the retrieval state is not thermodynamically stable. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, sure, I mean, you still have chances to converge there. Yeah, but you cannot tell that it's uh, suboptimal. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I overlooked this, but. Uh, okay. <laughs> so the red, line, the red line shows when the pattern becomes uh, higher than the optimal update. Uh, yes, they're, they're not only minima, but they are global minima. They are pure states. Before the red line. Yes, before on the left of the red line. Yes. So in that case, it doesn't work actually. Uh, I mean, if you're lucky, it, it can work. 
if you're lucky enough and you initialize in the Bayesian yeah, attraction, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, it can work, but you have no theoretical guarantees that that is a retrieval state. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you don't um, talk about search uh, in the very first line. And for alpha, it was the idea about the OSD. Yeah, this one, for and instance. You, so you can see this in alpha. So if you compare, sorry, this line with the obscured retrieval over the map, is it, is it better than the obscured retrieval over the map? So well, there is delta. I mean, with delta equal to zero, yeah, the, first, uh, the first overlap is the same. Oh. At the first, the first step, then it becomes different. It's a different neural network model. But the first one is the same. Yes. Uh, I, I, yeah. Actually, this first phase diagram is the hopeful with some with some noise. It's not nothing very fancy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, maybe I should say this because I think you have a poster here about this, right? About this dreaming or a learning procedure. There is a way to augment to increase the size of this basin of attractions of this uh, um, and to make them more stable, right? So if you're interested, have a look at uh, Enrico <laughs> post, Enrico's post. <laughs> uh, one last question before we uh, finish the presentation on this thing. Okay. It's a hard one. Uh, <laughs> That's a hard uh, one. I'm just curious about the difference of classic action and display parse data. Yes. Uh, pure op, yes, yes, yes. So That's here. Data, data, right? Yeah, it, it's here. Oh, yeah, it's this, this dashed lines. Or the solid lines if you want a thermodynamically stable. There is some literature about this, the, uh, I mean, but it is different because this is an inference problem. Um, the, in, in the paper I read, I don't even remember who is it from. In, in, that's my fault. But you have to modify the patterns in order to store them more efficiently into the Hebbian matrix. In a way, I don't recall. Uh, but here, you cannot do this, because this is an inference problem. So you are given some data, and you need to work with them. You cannot modify the Hebbian matrix. So with this, working with the, with the JIJ you saw at the very beginning, yes. The answer is, is, is yes. Thank you.